Hi ho botanists! Let's have a quick review of what we learned so far about the plant kingdom. We learned that plants are multicellular autotrophs with kind of complex organ systems and embryos that, as we will see soon, resemble a miniature adult. Plants are a clade, a group of plants that's adapted for life on land. Um, plants are believed to be evolved from uh, aquatic ancestors called algae, which um, uh, are not quite plants, but they have a lot of features in common with them. If you were a plant thinking about living on land, you might be very happy because of all the sunlight, because of all the carbon dioxide, and at least in the beginning, because there wasn't a lot of stuff that would make you sick or eat you. Um, problems though, man. What about drying out? Well, you could have a waxy covering called a cuticle. How about getting CO2 from the air instead of just having it diffused to you, and water from the ground instead of just being in it? Well, vascular tissue for some plants, plumbing, carrying food and water. How about being upright instead of being supported by buoyancy? Well, have cell walls that are imbued with a stiffening agent called lignin. And, ah, oh, the delicate fertilized egg in the embryo. Mm, you know, they could really dry out on land. Would be nice if there was a little pond kind of thing that they could stay in. And that's what the um, female gametangium, the archegonium, serves that purpose. It retains the egg and the zygote and even the embryo. And um, if you want to get rid of the need to be near, around water entirely, um, evolve seeds and pollen. Pollen uh, is a transport vessel vehicle for sperm. Um, you'll recall that um, algae are not plants. They have sperm that need to swim through water to reach the eggs, which, you know what, the female gametes might be uh, in the water as well. Mosses are non-vascular plants, um, so they tend to be small. They have to have uh, uh, environmental water for the sperm to swim to the egg, and um, they reproduce in part by spores, about which more later. Primitive seedless vascular plants, such as ferns, can be larger because they have actual roots. They have vascular tissue to carry resources around in uh, their body. They also, however, are kind of tied to water by needing environmental water to effect sexual reproduction. Seed plants, though, they're definitely vascular and they have seeds, uh, which are baby plants with some nutritive tissue and the coat. Details coming soon. Um, and they also have a, a, um, a shuttlecraft for sperm, which is a pollen grain. So the, the pollen travel in the wind or on the body of some uh, pollinating vector, like a bee or a bird or a bat or a butterfly. A um, lot of diversity in the plant kingdom and some major evolutionary innovations. Um, development of embryos inside the ga gametangium was an early one. Um, vascular tissue came a little later and more recently, seeds. There are three phyla of non-vascular plants um, that are called bryophytes. There are um, two phyla of seedless vascular plants, several different gymnosperms, and one phylum of flowering plants, the angiosperms. So here's a picture of um, a liverwort. This is one of the Marcantiophyta. It's a phylum of non-vascular plants, sometimes called in loose terms bryophytes. This is a hornwort. It looks kind of like a liverwort, except the sporophytes are horn-like. And here's a moss, where you can see the leafy gametophyte and the tall, upright sporophytes. We also have seedless vascular plants, including this club moss. One word, please, because it's not really a moss. It's a vascular plant that has spiral arrangements of sporangia and a club-like strobilis. And ferns, the more commonly widespread, well-known seedless vascular plants. Here's a fern sporophyte showing clusters of sporangia on the undersurface. There's a close-up of those sporangia. And um, gymnosperms, the naked seeded plants, of which a pine is an example. This pine cone at the base of those scales has seeds that are just loosely enveloped, enveloped, um, but not contained completely within any sort of structure. And then finally, angiosperms, the superstars of the plant kingdom, with flowers, with stamens and pistils, and most importantly, the base of the pistil, the ovary, which contains the fruits, uh, excuse me, the seeds, and it is called a fruit. We learned about life cycles, and we learned about, especially interested in um, haploid versus diploid, having one set of chromosomes or more than one. 
And we learned that um, mitosis is like cloning, where we have two cells, two nuclei rather, with the same number and kind of chromosomes. We learned that meiosis is reductive division, where we have four nuclei that have half the number of chromosomes. We learned that a gamete is a single cell that needs to fuse with another gamete. Both of them are haploid, and when they fuse, they form a diploid zygote, aka fertilized egg. We learned that the zygote, we just mentioned it again, is the fertilized egg. And something new-ish is a spore, which is kind of like a gamete, but um, instead of needing to fuse with something, it's a haploid cell that divides by mitosis to form a new haploid multicellular organism. Life cycles. Uh, we learned three. The goal of which was to fully understand the best of them all, the plant life cycle. The animal life cycle has multicellular diploid individuals, and so it's called diplontic, which produce gametes, eggs, and sperm in gonads, ovaries or testes, respectively. Yeah, and um, these haploid gametes fuse together to form a diploid zygote. Animal life cycle, pretty familiar to us. What I call the weird haplontic algae fungus life cycle, um, what's weird about it is that it's different than the animal life cycle. There are multicellular haploid organisms, and the only diploid stage in the life cycle is the zygote. The multicellular haploid organisms form their gametes by mitosis, surprise, which fuse together to form the diploid zygote, which undergoes meiosis to form four haploid cells that develop all by themselves by mitosis to form new multicellular haploid individuals. And those are spores, of course. And then finally, ta-da, the plant life cycle, which has um, two stages. It's called the alternation of generations life cycle. One of the stages is the sporophyte, which is a diploid plant that produces spores, hence the name sporophyte. The gametophyte is a haploid plant that produces gametes, hence the name gametophyte. And here is the beautiful alternation of generations life cycle. It has a diploid sporophyte that produces spores in a structure called a sporangium by meiosis and produces lots of them because there are lots of so-called spore mother cells in the sporangium. They develop by mitosis to form haploid gametophytes, which might not actually be separate individuals the way they're sketched here, but conceptually, um, functionally, we have male antheridia produced and female archegonia produced, and within which gametes are produced by mitosis, and they fuse together to form the diploid zygote. Boom, two different stages in the life cycle, sporophyte and gametophyte, either of which could be a plant. I mean, they are a plant, either of which could be called a plant. So here's another diagram showing the same information. A sporophyte plant produces spores by meiosis, which develop by mitosis to form a gametophyte plant, which produces gametes by mitosis, which fuse together to form a diploid zygote. It's a cycle. So. Looking at actual plants, what are these sporophytes and gametophytes? Uh, throughout the process of plant evolution, there's been a tendency for the gametophyte to become progressively smaller compared with the sporophyte. The bryophytes, the relatively primitive bryophytes, the dominant stage in the life cycle is the gametophyte. So a leafy plant with stems and leaves that forms like a bed of moss, those are gametophytes. If you look really careful at gametophytes, carefully, or close up actually, with a microscope, You'll see in some of them um, male gametangia, which are called antheridia, that look sort of like hot dogs, and female archegonia, which kind of look like eggs uh, in a bottle, an egg in a bottle, a bottle with an egg in it. Environmental water is necessary in order for sexual reproduction to take place, in order for the sperm to meet the egg. And fertilization occurs in the archegonium, and the zygote develops. And the sporophyte develops. And the sporophyte of a moss is hmm, comparatively small and inconspicuous relative to the gametophyte. It's stalked. It has one relatively large sporangium. And it's permanently attached to its mother. It's parasitic on the uh, female gametophyte. And so you'll never see a sporophyte without a gametophyte. Although you could see a gametophyte without a sporophyte, meiosis takes place to produce spores. There's a picture of a moss, mostly gametophyte, but over on the right you see some sporophytes. Here's another moss that has sporophytes that aren't especially erect or tall, but both stages are shown there nonetheless. Here you see all gametophyte. Um, 
If you look carefully, you might see some sporophytes, stalks with sporangia on top. Here's another one of those. If you look inside the moss tips with a microscope, you see archegonia and antheridia. Okay. The fern life cycle takes the step of evolution a bit further, where the sporophyte is the dominant stage in the life cycle. If you see a fern, you're seeing a sporophyte. It's leafy, it's conspicuous, and it produces spores. Typically on the undersurface of leaves, clusters of sporangia undergo meiosis to produce spores that germinate into a small structure about the size of a fingernail. It's green, it's dorsi ventrally flattened, and in almost all instances, they're bisexual, hermaphroditic, having archegonia and antheridia. The archegonia ha look like an egg in a bottle because it basically is an egg in a bottle. Environmental water is still necessary for the sperm to swim to the egg. The zygote is uh, produced and nurtured within the, the archegonium. And for a moment, we see an old gametophyte with a young sporophyte, a configuration that's reminiscent of a bryophyte, but the sporophyte gets big and big and big, and the gametophyte, having done its job, withers away. Here's a picture of a fern, sporophyte, and if you look at the undersurface of those slightly smaller leaves at the top, you see clusters of sporangia, and if you look in the ground nearby, you may see gametophytes with young sporophytes growing out of them. Many ferns have their sporangia on the undersurface of otherwise normal appearing leaves, such as this lady fern. Some ferns have specially modified leaves that are completely devoted to the production of spores, such as this cinnamon fern. Large sporangia on the cinnamon fern. So if you had to describe, you know, basically what's up with the moss and fern sporophytes and gametophytes, how would you describe them? And, you know, moss gametophyte is fairly small, but it's the leafy plant, the stem with leaves, that forms the bed of the moss. The moss sporophyte is attached to the gametophyte and consists of a stalk and a, typically a stalk, not always, and a sporangium, one sporangium. The fern, on the other hand, the, the uh, gametophyte is a really small thing about the size of a fingernail, and the sperm fern sporophyte is the leafy thing that you would call a fern. Flowers. This is a, uh, the superstars of the plant kingdom, and you'll recall that flowers have parts. Um, uh, the pedicel is the stalk of the flower. The receptacle is where the flower parts are attached. The sepals are usually leaf-like and protect the flower and bud. The petals are colorful and attract pollinators. The male part of the flower consists of a pollen sac called an anther and a slender supportive stalk, sometimes slender, called a filament. Those are stamens. The female part of the flower, which we can call a pistil, has the very important lower part, which is called an ovary with ovules inside. The stigma, which is a pollen receptive surface, and the style, which connects the stigma and the ovary. Pollination takes place when pollen gets transferred from a stamen to a stigma, and what the pollen does is it grows. It's a living thing, and it grows a tube down the style into the ovule. There is an egg in the ovule, and there's sperm in the pollen grain. A seed um, is an embryo or baby plant with a seed coat and nutritive, nutritive tissue, and it's contained within an a ripened ovary, which is a fruit. So finally, what is the gametophytes in flowering plants? They're very, very, very tiny. Remember, we said reduction of the gametophyte is a feature that characterizes plant evolution. Mosses, the gametophyte was the dominant stage. Ferns, it was kind of small. You had to really look carefully to see one. Flowering plant gametophytes, the female gametophyte is completely contained within the sporophyte, and the male gametophyte is just a pollen grain. It only consists of three cells, really. So, um, again, the male gametophyte is the germinated pollen grain. And this picture shows basically three nuclei, or cells, it's hard to say exactly what they are, one of which is the tube nucleus, and it's basically um, regulating the physiological activities of this living thing, which is a plant. And it grows an extension called a pollen tube that goes through the style and bursts into the ovule, and it contains two sperm. That's the flowering plant male gametophyte, teeny little thing. Inside the ovule, inside what's going to become a seed, and this is the attachment to the mother plant, there's a little opening through which the pollen tube bursts. 
there are only eight nuclei inside this female gametophyte. Wimpy little thing. And the only ones we really care about are uh, the egg, of course. It's a gametophyte. It has a gamete. And these two in the middle that are called central cells or polar nuclei. And remember there's a phenomenon called double fertilization. And when double fertilization is, one sperm fuses, does what you'd expect it to do, which it fertilizes with an egg to form a zygote. The other sperm, I don't know how they decide which one, they flip a coin, I don't know. Is it a race? I don't know. Um, fuses with both central cells to form a triploid, a, a triploid tissue. And that tissue is called endosperm. That's nutritive tissue. Um, later, we're going to see that most plants, or many plants at least, their nutritive tissue is something called a cotyledon, um, which forms after the, nu the endosperm forms. Some seeds, the endosperm is the principal nutritive tissue. And that's a brief review of the plant kingdom. Coming up, a little more details about flowers. Thanks for tuning in. Botany out.